Alrighty, everybody, welcome to another one of these, you know, one of these, one of these kind of things, one of these YouTubes kind of thing. Hello, everybody, welcome to YouTube. I'm Techie 101, an old-fashioned radio voice. Yep, doing kind of, I don't know why the lighting is kind of spoopy. We're not really doing a spoopy kind of video today. It's just uh, first impressions of the Straw Hat crew. Which we actually have to get moving on because I only have about an hour to get this done because I have to, I, I do not plan my schedule well. So we, we got to get this done quick. I think it'll be okay because we're not doing a tier list. We're not doing a tournament or anything like that. We're just going to literally go through all 10 members of the Straw Hat crew and we're going to uh, talk about the first impressions of that character. Which medium did you uh, first encounter them, whether it be through the manga or the anime? What dub of the anime uh, did that impact your emotions or your feelings for the character? Have your opinions of that character? Or changed since uh, their first introduction. Why, why with the ch the scary chopper? Because it's a video on first impressions, so I thought about, you know, what I, I was like fumbling around with a thumbnail a little bit, and I was like, I was gonna do Robin at first. Like one of the scrapped thumbnails was gonna be this kind of like with like I, I was trying to put first impressions on the thumbnail. Impressions is just too long of a word, so I couldn't get it to look right. So I'm thinking, all right, let's 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 scrap that idea. And I went with uh creepy chopper. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was gonna do one with the words on it, but I'm like, you know what? That detracts from it. Let's just do- that's too reductive. Let's just go with actual creepy chopper staring into your soul. <laughs> because we've all had those awkward moments where you're trying to be good with first impressions, and, uh, you're just crap at it. So, it, you know, it's- it's everybody. It happens to everyone. It's fine. Cursed chopper. No, no chopper was better. No, all chopper is better. Okay, uh, you like my shirt? Well, thank you. It's a Tetris shirt. But no, we gotta get moving because I gotta get going in like an hour because I'm gonna go do D&D &D tonight. I'm hanging out with some friends. Uh, could have. I was gonna do this video earlier, didn't get it done, and then I was gonna film it now, and I'm like, wait a minute. I only have an hour, so filming it and editing it, it's probably not gonna work, so let's just do it live stream format. And then we're gonna spin the wheel at the end of this and we'll figure out what we're doing next. Also, it's kind of nice to have you guys in here because we are talking about first impressions, so it's good to have, like, a feedback of, like, you know, what was your first impression of one of the Straw Hats. So, with that all being said, yeah, we gotta get moving. So, first Straw Hat we're talking about, Monkey D. Luffy. Now, I wanna give a little bit of a background before, you know, we really talk about Luffy. So, the way that I first was introduced to the Straw Hats, like many Americans... It was through the 4Kids dub, okay? Now, that's not a great dub. I'm sure there's probably shittier dubs out there that have existed, but it's not the best. But, you know, it's what me and a lot of other kids, like, growing up around my area, like, a couple of them watched One Piece, and um, this is the dub we got, all right? So, uh, the first seven Straw Hats from Luffy to Robin were all 4Kids dubbed for me. That was my first impressions of them, okay? And you don't really get to go back and do first impressions again. I mean, I could go and watch, like, the Funimation dub, which, by the way, R.I.P. Funimation, they got kind of, like, uh, molded into Crunchyroll, so, yeah, that, that's the end of an era there. But, um, so my first impressions with Luffy, his 4Kids voice... Uh, a lot more uh, high in in the uh, like octave department. I remember watching old episodes of One Piece with my friend Cody, and I really liked it. Like even with the four kids dub, I really liked One Piece. Like I want to let let everybody know about that. Like I actually liked four kids Sanji. I liked, you know, regular Sanji more, but when Sanji first showed up, I really did think he was cool. I thought the Brooklyn accent was actually kind of neat, you know, um, so that was my opinion. I was 12, by the way. Uh, I actually did go back to check to see how old I was, like, when I first started watching One Piece. And as, as far as I could tell, because I didn't watch it, like, first episode of it, um, but my first uh, impression, I think, was... Whiskey Peak, it was uh, the episode where Luffy fought Zoro, okay? And I remember, like, being on, like, watching WB in the morning and, like, you know, Zoro versus Luffy in this new action-packed episode of One Piece. I think that was the first episode I watched, and then everything else was, like, reruns later, okay? So if that was the case, I looked it up. That episode came out in August of 2005, so I would have been 12, okay? So I'm watching this episode with Cody, and I asked him at the end of it, because I really liked One Piece, I'm like, what did you think of it? And Cody looked at me and he's like, it's an okay cartoon, because like everything was a cartoon back then, like anime wasn't. Like, he was like, yeah, it's an okay cartoon, but 
the main character's voice is just so damn annoying. Like, I remember my friend Cody is like, my God, Luffy's voice is so annoying. And I'm like, I didn't find it annoying. Definitely more high pitched than every other voice. I like, well, actually, you know, because the um, the Japanese is a little bit higher, but like it, it just I, I thought it was fine. Um, it, there wasn't anything to Luffy in particular I can really think about that, like, put me off the series. Uh, very energetic, uh, jumping around and all over the place. And honestly, kind of fit really into that role of, okay, this is our main character. Like, it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but it's just, it's just like, there's a main character archetype, and it's like, especially for anime. And, you know, like, one of those in anime is main character of shonen anime eats a lot. You know what I mean? So we had that with Goku. We have that with Luffy. Um, not every main character does that, but like back when I was watching it, like a lot did, you know, cause the, just the ones that I was kind of, you know, um, introduced to there. Um, in terms of his devil fruit ability, I thought it was fine. I, I don't really, you know, it's funny thinking back. I don't really have any moments with Luffy that made me like, like really stood out to me. Like, oh my God, this character is incredible or this character is boring. It was more about just like, okay, the story is about a kid that wears a straw hat that has a stretchy body. Okay, like that's our main character. Like, okay, I'm okay with that. I don't know. I feel like I should have had more of an impression from the main character. Once again, maybe if I got started on the original Japanese or if like a, a different dub might have been different. But like Luffy's first outing as as uh, in the four kids dub was like perfectly just average to me. And I was like, okay, following along with Luffy here wasn't my favorite at the beginning. Uh, but was like, okay, cool. Yeah, this is our main character. It's kind of hard. It's, it's, it feels like there should be more to it than that. But that was my first impression of him, right? I'm trying to think of anything else that, like, um, I remember in the Alabasta arc, they changed it in the four kids dub where Luffy had to fight him with, like, just his sweat, not blood. So I remember when I picked up the um, Alabasta movie, which was the first thing I think Funimation did, or at least the first, not the first thing Funimation did, because they, it was all a mess. Like four kids dubbed part of One Piece, and then right around Jaya, Funimation took over, but they still called the characters what they did in the fun, in the four kids dub. Like like Ace was still Trace to keep consistency, consistency, and then they went back and changed it again. So it's like a whole mess. But I remember watching the Alabasta arc, and then they got into the tomb. And I was like, oh, this is the scene where he fights Crocodile with his sweat. And no, it was blood. And I, I was like 15 at that point watching the movie. And I was like, oh, man, that is way cooler. <laughs> you know, that was way more badass. Like Luffy's just covered in his own blood, beating the shit out of Crocodile. I'm like, all right, OK, that's cooler. That was probably the first big moment of Luffy that I was like, that's cool. All right, because a lot of his really cool moments, like the scene where he was fighting Krieg, and he gets impaled by the darts, and in the uh, in the original, he just like rips the darts out of his body. In the four kids dubs, they were suction cups. So you just have a scene where Luffy's pulling suction cups off of his body, which that's not really cool. So I guess I guess in the Funimation, it's like okay, no, this isn't just some wacky kid hopped up on sugar. He's a pretty serious guy and pretty badass when you really push him to that level, okay? He's not just like, suction cups, no, he's just, he gets stabbed and he's like, you're not taking away my crew, you're going down, Krieg! <laughs> and I was like, okay, alright, yeah, now this is, that's pretty good, yeah, that's pretty good. So there, there it is. Uh, but even four kids couldn't, like, ruin Luffy, if anything, just pushed Luffy down to, like, eh, for me. So, that, that was my first impressions of, of the main character, of Luffy. Alright. Next up, we got Zoro. Rora Noah. Zoro. You know the first thing I remember about Zoro? <laughs> this is great. So remember after Luffy and Kobe save him from the cross, although it was not a, it was T-posing. He was T-posing in the four kids dub. You can't have a cross. So they save him from that, and he hasn't eaten in like a month. It's like 30 days or something without food. Yeah, maybe I should do a one out of 10 sort of thing. With Luffy... 5 out of 10. First impressions with Luffy with the 4 kids dub, 5 out of 10. So, Zoro. He's up there, they save him, they take out Morgan, and they go back to the pub, and Zoro is just, like, devouring all the food in the pub, because he hasn't eaten in, like, a month. And, uh, I, I think I went up to one of my parents after that, my mom or my dad, and, uh, I was like, so if you're starving, can you just eat a bunch of food and you're fine? And they're like, no, you'd probably go into shock and die. And I'm thinking, wow, this character's so cool. He did that because I didn't understand, like, 
it's an anime, so the things that are in anime aren't exactly real. So I interpreted that like, wow, a normal person would go into shock and die, but Zoro didn't. That's how badass he is. That's clearly what the author was going for there, not just the fact that, you know, it's anime realism just kind of goes out the window. <laughs> you know, they saved him from T-posing, a fate worse than death. Um, you know... Zoro, uh, the three sword thing definitely had more of an impression. Uh, I thought it was pretty badass. That was pretty cool. Uh, I remember like at this point, got to keep in mind, I'm watching like Dragon Ball Z and Yu Yu Hakusho. All right. And those characters like Yusuke and Goku and everybody, they can fire like energy blasts and they could do all these really cool things with like key and aura and stuff like that. And then one piece I remember being probably one of the first, even Naruto, Naruto I think was right around the time I was watching this. It was right around the time I started watching Naruto, so they had Chakra. So I remember like my first impression of One Piece in general being like, oh, okay, they they have these these fruits that give you power. In the four kids dub, they were cursed fruits, not devil fruits, but it's not the same thing as like energy beams. It's not like Luffy's using energy and stuff, so when Zoro's busting out three swords, I'm like, okay, it's not as cool as Yusuke firing a spirit gun, but, like, I think it's because maybe it was more slightly grounded in reality. Because, you know, actually, somebody on YouTube actually did do the three sword thing. And the way it, 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 that McKenyu pulls it off in the live action, I mean, obviously, that's with special effects. He doesn't have a real sword in his mouth. There, you know. But still, like, the way it looks in live action is not bad. It's pretty good, actually, the way he pulls it off. So, um, I remember it being more grounded. Maybe that's the reason why I, I liked it so much. I don't know. It's like, oh, okay, three swords, and he's able to, like, whip up, like, tornadoes and, like, slice people down and everything like that. I'm like, all right, all right. His first impression to me was definitely more than the average that I'm going to give Luffy. Also, um, oh, what was, I always forget, Mark Diarison, I think, the um, actor that played him in the 4Kids dub, he was probably out of all of the original, like, Straw Hats, maybe out of the entire cast. The Crocodile's voice was really good, too. Um, was, was probably the best. You know, Crocodile and Zoro's voice actor. Really solid choices. Um, I think if they would have taken his 4Kids dub voice, like, Saba is great. But if they were to br bring him over into uh, the Funimation dub, it would have been fine. Like, you know, the way that uh, Mark Di I think it's Mark Diarison um, did it. Yeah, it it his voice was fine. Um, and actually, you know what? In a way, I would have preferred that even more than than Sabbath. I, I know. I, a lot of, but Chris Sabbath's amazing. He's incredible. It's just he was in a lot of things. Like, so he has like when I same thing was like I hear Piccolo like for a while when when he was dubbing Zoro, all I could hear was Piccolo for a while. And then it's like, after a while, it's like, okay, he's Zoro now, but like, you know, it's the same guy. So, yeah. Um, my first impression of Zoro was better than Luffy because Three Sword style was also very unique. Yeah, I mean, granted, turning your body into rubber was also a very unique fighting style. But just Zoro being, I think just Zoro, by, by virtue of him being the swordsman, was like, okay, he's... I, I'm a 12-year-old kid that loves anime, so swords are automatically there for me. So I'm like, yeah. Um... Zoro is so cool. He is pretty damn cool. You should challenge Ohara to a fight, but you can only use One Piece named attacks. I think I would win. Sure, totally. <laughs> uh, did they call Luffy Rufy in English dub? In some, they did. In not in the four kids dub. He was still Luffy there. Um, yeah, but Chris Sabat went from green Namekian to green-haired samurai. I don't know if that was the reason, and it probably wasn't. Uh, yeah. Zoro always had those three earrings. I always thought that very cool. I thought that was an interesting... His design was, was pretty neat, yeah. Conventional anime badass swordsman, right? Yeah, he was okay. Uh, definitely ranking higher than Luffy. I'll probably put Zoro at, like, 7 out of 10 for first impressions. Keep in mind, if you're very upset by that, remember... Th this is through the lens of the four kids dub, and we're not gonna get out of that until Frankie. <laughs> okay? So this is... As an American, growing up with this particular dub... Let me ask you a question in the audience, actually. Which dub of One Piece did you first, like, watch? Okay, was it the original Japanese? Was it, like, the Funimation? Was it, like, the, I think the Odex dub? Or Animax? Or, like, there was a bunch of other different versions of, uh, of One Piece. Yeah. Uh, I'm late, but I just started Wano for real. Well, good luck to you. It's a long arc, but I like it. I, a lot of people say at the end it kind of, it's a little bit too long and it kind of drags, but I really enjoyed Wano. Uh, we got the Greek dub, we got four kids, four kids, the Italian dub, the German dub. 
I wish I was multilingual so I could rank every single dub fairly, but sadly I am not. So I, there's just no way for me to fairly rank like the Italian dub because I can't speak Italian. Yeah. Funimation dub, the manga. The manga would have been the best for you to start with, honestly. I didn't start reading the manga until at least two years. No, it would have been like a year. 13 is when I first got my, I started reading Shonen Jump. So it would have been about a year or so after four kids. Um, the Italian dub, yeah. Cries in monolingual. No, that is one thing. Like teleportation powers would be cool, but if I had a choice between mastering like five languages or teleportation, oh, that would be tough. I might go the multilingual route. Yeah, because it would be so cool to have. Like that's one thing. Like I wish we had like the Matrix kind of thing. Like if technology ever gets to that level, you could just like download a language into your head. I would do that a hundred percent. I don't even care about the implications. I would do it. Mm. I want to speak. I, I want to speak uh, Mandarin Chinese. Okay, there it is. I was like, that would be awesome. I don't care. He's like, well, this could fry your brain. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Test subject zero. Let's rock. Oh, man. But that's Zoro. So I'll go Zoro 7 out of 10 through the four kids light. All right, let's go Nami. Nami may surprise you. Let's see if we have any old school Nami pictures on here. We have any short haired Nami. Most of these are post time skip. Uh, we have one post, uh, we have one pre-time skip Nami. This is from a little later in the story, but okay. So, um, you know, I, I, Nami is, is definitely now in the story, the way she's, uh, like with her different outfits and stuff. She's, she's way more of a sex symbol, I would say, uh, you know, sp specifically her post-time skip outfit. I mean, her, her first post-time skip outfit was literally... Just her wearing a bikini top. So, you know, that was the idea there. Uh, like, you know, yeah. So, at the beginning of the story, though, Nami really wasn't, like, overly sexualized as much. So, my point is, even though I'm, like, 12, I'm not watching, like, the first time seeing Nami in, like, Orange Town, or I guess it would be Whiskey Peak. That was the first one I was, I was watching. It wasn't like, oh, ooga, she's so hot, you know? Um... I liked uh, the aspect of, I, I really, so, I remember reading, this, this is very really scattershot in memories, I remember reading Arlong Park in the Shonen Jump uh, magazines that would come out in the US. Uh, we had like a watered down version of Shonen Jump, it wasn't every single um, series, because the Shonen Jump in Japan is like thick. Ours was like this one, but One Piece was in there, and I remember reading Arlong Park from that, so... Like, I knew about Nami because I watched Whiskey Peak first, but then the manga was at Arlong Park. I remember being in eighth grade reading it. So that was probably more of my first impression of Nami because that was Nami's arc. And I remember specifically the scene where Nami is pretending to kill Usopp where, like, she stabs him and he goes into the water. Like, I remember that scene. And I that scene, by the way, because... It's changed and been, like, you know, because of the dubs and the manga and everything. Even the English manga would edit things sometimes. So I don't even remember now. I don't have a clear memory of if she actually stabbed him or it was fake. <laughs> I don't think she actually stabbed him, right? But there's been so many weird edits that it's just like... I think the 4Kids dub... The 4Kids dub did this thing where after the smoke happened... Like, they added an extra line over it where Nami said stuff where she didn't actually say it. And it's like, hey, Usopp, just play dead here, okay? That was not in the thing. She stabbed her own arm. That was it. Yeah, that's been, that scene has been so flipped around. I have, like, five conflicting memories of it, to be honest with you. Because <laughs> there's one where it was a rubber knife. There's others where she says to Usopp to play dead. There's one version where they probably, like, played it off like, you know, oh, Usopp just fell into the water by accident or something. You know what I mean? So she stabbed her hand. Yeah, so there's that. I don't even remember if that was in the Shonen Jump version. In the Tonko Bonds back here, it would have been unedited. But in the original Shonen Jumps, I, I still don't, I don't have those copies anymore. I have no idea what it would have been. Um... She stabbed her hand. That would have been it. Yeah. That sounds like the way Oda would have actually written it and drawn it. Right? 
Um, so my point is, my first impressions of Nami came from the story arc where she was trying very hard to not, like, get the Straw Hats in danger, and leading to that, that means she was kind of, like, uh, horrible to them, uh, for that reason. Like, there was a very conflicting arc for Nami, uh, and then eventually, I remember Do getting to the scene, the walk to Arlong Park moment, I remember getting to that in the magazine, I remember that. Uh, the crying moment. So her stuff might be higher than Zoro's because in terms of character development, Zoro gets some, Luffy gets some, Sanji gets a little bit. I remember Sanji's backstory very, very well. Usopp's does as well. But like the, the straw hat whose backstory is fleshed out the most in the East Blue, it's not even a debate. It's Nami's. Okay, because we don't find out about the rest of Luffy's backstory until post Marineford. Zoro's is very brief, and honestly, I feel like there's a lot more about Zoro's backstory we could have explored in Wano. Usopp's is pretty brief. Sanji's is part of his backstory, but not all of it. So, Nami gets a lot there, where we find out about her childhood, and how she was an orphan, and then raised by Belmere, and then Belamere was sent to the dungeons by Arlong, and uh, all that. So, I think just for that the fact of you find out so much about her there, uh, I would give her probably a 9 out of 10 for my first impressions on Nami, okay? I, I now, like, her, the first time she shows up is actually episode 1 in the anime, but I didn't watch episode 1 until later. It was like, Whiskey Peak, and I'm reading the manga in Shonen Jump a little later, and then catching reruns on Cartoon Network, and they aired on different networks. I remember Cartoon Network picked up four kids later, but Kids WB had it first. I just very scattershotted memories here. Yeah. I didn't care for Nami until Arlong Park, so I, like, first was introduced to her, like, her real character in Arlong Park. Yeah. Wasn't Wano, like, almost 200 episodes? Uh, it was 150-plus chapters, Definitely, probably, they could have stretched that out to over 200 episodes, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's the climax of the East Blues, so that's, like, re really where Oda put his, like, best stuff forward. And I always say to people that if you want to get into One Piece, but you're a little daunted by the sheer size of it, like, over 1,100 chapters at this point, read up until Arlong Park. And if you're not sold by the end of Arlong Park, you're probably not going to be sold... You could, I mean, like, Alabasta might be it, but, like, Arlong Park is the big one, the first big one culmination, right? If you love Arlong Park, if you're a little bit like, ah, I'm not sure about Syrup Village, I didn't really care for this arc, Arlong Park really kind of coalesces everything and, like, what Oda's storytelling is and how he does character development and backstories and stuff. So, yeah. And it's less than 100 chapters to Arlong Park, so I would say that. But, yeah, Nami, I'm gonna give a 9 out of 10, right? Yeah. It wasn't until, by the way, yeah, it wasn't really until, like, Skypea when she's walking around in, like, the, the bikini for the first time. That's when it was really, like, oh, she's hot. Like, that was later. That came way later, okay, in terms of that. Like, that was also four kids, I think, made it to Skypea. I think four kids dubbed, I think they dubbed a little bit of Skypea. But no, 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 no. It would have been Funimation by that. I think they dubbed a little bit. No, it was... It was Rainbow Mist. I think they did Rainbow Mist, and then that was the last four kids dubbed of their voices. And then Funimation switched over from there. Yeah. I think that was it. I think that was it. Okay. Uh, next up, we got Usapu. See, we got the earliest image of Usopp here. Ah, here's one. There we go. There we go. East Blue Usopp covered in, in the ketchup of his enemies. <laughs> All right. First impressions of Usopp here. Um, even as a kid, I could tell where that arc was going because Syrup Village and the arc of Usopp in that arc is, the arc of Usopp in that arc is, it's the boy who cried wolf. I mean, that's what Oda was going for. It's really on the nose. Oh, is that another reference? It's on the nose because he's, he's got the nose. So like right away with Usopp, I'm like, okay, he always goes around saying that like pirates are coming, the pirates are coming. Let me guess, the pirates are going to come, and then no one actually believes him, and then the pi the, the the entire island gets attacked. Let me guess, that's that's what's going to happen, right? And it is what happened. Okay, um, I I, I remember like watching that arc and just being like, 
Kuro's the the bad guy. Like he's clearly an evil butler. Why does no one see he's the evil butler? Uh, yeah, so that that that's not so much about Usopp. That's just my memories of Syrup Village in general. Uh, like clearly this guy's evil. Like it's obvious, right? Like clearly, even in like the the actor that played Kuro in the live action also nailed him perfectly. And it's like clearly the evil guy. Come on now, <laughs> like yeah. So, uh, and it's the story of Pinocchio. It's the story of, you know, the boy who cried wolf. Um, I think Usopp is supposed to be more of, like, the everyman. Like, he's a kid that just grows up in a small town, and he, he's, you know, playing with his friends and pretending they're going on grand adventures, like slaying dragons and delving into dungeons and stuff like that. It's like Dungeons and Dragons or something. And uh, at the end of the day, they're just going on, like, you know, adventures in the forest or something like that, right? You know, it's like, we will slay the dragon, and it's just a squirrel, right? Like, that's supposed to be, like, Usopp's character. Uh, he didn't have a crazy backstory like Luffy growing up in the Grey Terminal. He wasn't trained to be a swordsman or anything like that. He, he he lost his mom, which is the way more, like, relatable one because, like, dude, if you lost a parent at a young age, um, Usopp's backstory would probably resonate you way more. And that's something that happens more often than, like, you know, uh, more often than, like, Luffy's backstory that involved one of the Tenerubito, you know? You know? So... I, I think it's he's supposed to be more relatable in that regard. Like, he's just a guy. He's just a normal kid. Yeah, he's a really good sniper, but he's a normal kid that is seeking attention, but at the same time, he's very good-hearted. He's not doing it to be mean. Uh, he's just doing it for, like, his, he, it's his... It's his coping mechanism. That's what it is. It's his coping mechanism, yeah. Every butler looks evil, butler. No, no, no. Not every butler is evil. Not every butler is evil. But I'm just saying, if you see a guy with slicked bla uh, slick back hair and he walks around super robotically, he's like, Miss Kaya, you shouldn't be talking to the riffraff. You know, it's like, oh, this guy's evil. Come on now. Like, yeah. Um, he's got that plastic slingshot. Yeah, he never believed in his sniping for a while. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. Um, his voice in the four kids dub. I remember it being very intentionally, like, goofy, okay? Like, because that's, like, a lot of 4Kids' voices were a little bit silly and wacky. Like, Luffy's voice is, like, a little kid kind of hopped up on sugar. Sanji with the Brooklyn accent. Um, there's another character. Miss Valentine is voiced by the same person that did Tails in Sonic. It's a weird trip, man. It's, it's a weird trip watching 4Kids. Um, yeah. Slicked back hair and talks like a weirdo. I mean, come on. Yeah. Uh, Usopp, I, I, I think Usopp would be also like a 5 out of 10. Same kind of thing with Luffy, right? Same kind of category as Luffy there. Yeah. It's a shame four kids never made it to Brooke. You know what? Uh... I think they could have done Brooke pretty well. There is a there. It's not an official four kids dub, but they did a dub of um, what is it? Uh, Frankie. Like not th there was a guy that did a parody of the four kids dub, but with Frankie and uh, fighting against Nero on top of the train, and they just gave him the Arnie voice. He's just like, yeah, I'll be back. I am the Terminator. You know, I like that is basically. And I was like, if four kids would have continued to Frankie. That is 100% the fucking voice they would have gave him. You know, and it is just, it's just like, it's just like, I am the Frankenator. <laughs> like, that would have been, that would have been the voice. Yeah, you have been annihilated. Super. You know, like, yeah, that would have been that. All right, so uh, that's Usopp. Five out of ten Usopp. Now we get to Sanji. Oh, man, Sanji was the coolest. All right, let's get East Blue Sanji. Oh, man, do I have any East Blue Sanjis? Do I have any Sanjis with his hair parted on the other side of his face? Uh, no, 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 no. Man, not, not a lot of love for pre-time skip Sanji here. All right. Well, I have uh, this one. That's that's all. That's Yeah, okay. So that's yeah. That's obviously Whole Cake Island. That's goatee, Sanji. All right. I thought Sanji was the fucking coolest, man. I really did. He showed up. I, I like the hair. I like the suit. 
I liked his fighting style. He just kicking people around. Yeah, I liked his backstory. Like, man, he starved to death on a rock. It's like, man, I it was it was genuine. I was invested in that one. Like, I was genuinely, truly, as a twelve year old, super invested in Sanji's backstory. Because I think we can all understand that going without food for like eighty something days on that rock, you know. And they're like, yes, they did change the whole thing with Zeph, but that Zeph thing had been changed even in the original anime. That was changed with like him losing the leg. Uh, I don't even know how they framed it exactly in the four kids that you know actually okay you know what i remember there's no way the four kids dub would have said zeph ate his own leg but even with that i i think when i first watched it that was like the way i took it like i watched that scene and it was very clear to me that like oh zeph ate his own leg like i don't remember my first impressions of that flashback being Oh, Zeph cut off his own leg because he had to free Sanji. I, I literally just like, oh yeah, he ate his leg because he was starving and his leg's gone. Like, I could connect the dots even then. Um, the, 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 yeah, okay. I thought the lollipop was cool. I thought eating the lollipop, like, like just him sucking on the, just the Tootsie Pop or whatever was just like, that's cool, man. I'm, I'm Sanji. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm gonna beat you down over here. <laughs> That's not how he talked. He's like, Nami, my love. You know, just like, I thought, man, he's so badass. He's just sucking on a sucker and he could kick your ass. I just thought that was cool. I knew, like, I could I could connect the dots with Zeph in the leg, but I did not connect the dots with the sucker and the cigarette. I didn't know he was actually supposed to be a cigarette. Why just couldn't it be a toothpick? That would have been harder to edit with the toothpick. It's very clearly, like, look, it's either, uh, it's either a Tootsie Pop or it's a cigarette. You know what I mean? You can't really have both. Okay. Uh, yeah. I also start, you know what? And the four kids dub actually had a whole scene when they got to reverse mountain where they changed everything around because they cut out, they cut out reverse mountain arc. They cut out Laboon and crocus and everything. So when the Straw Hats reach the Reverse Mountain, they go up it, and then they go down, and there's an iceberg, and they destroy the iceberg, and they just go straight into Whiskey Peak. All right? Straight into Whiskey Peak. And in order to get around, like, well, how'd they get the log pose? How do they know how to use it? They actually added an extra scene where Usopp was like, yeah, my dad, Yasop, gave me a log pose. I just forgot I had it this whole time. And then Sanji's like, I think I know how to do use it, Nami. Zeph told me how to navigate the Grand Line. And it's like, well, you know what? Okay, Usopp just forgetting he had a log pose. But, like, at the same time, I could s I mean, that's not ridiculous. Like, Yasop leaving one behind. Like, in case Usopp wants to ever leave this town and become a pirate, I'll leave one for him. That's not out of the realm of impossibility. I mean, that kind of works. But the idea of, like... Before Sanji leaving, Zeph going over to him and be like, Remember this, Sanji. The way that you navigate the Grand Line is with the magnetic charge. Never lose sight of that compass. Whatever the compass tells you to do, follow the compass, Sanji. You know? <laughs> I don't know if that was close to Zeph's voice. But that actually makes sense, because Zeph has fucking been there. Zeph has been there for like a year. He even offered to give the logbook to Luffy, and Luffy's like, nah, I don't want the logbook, I want to do my own adventure. But it would make sense Zeph would tell him, like, this is how you use it. Like, okay, so that's not in that's not incredulous, right? Wasn't Nami supposed to be the navigator? Okay, this is one thing that's very, very important, okay? Because people brought this up in the live action that Nami... Nami in the live action doesn't seem to know what the what the reverse mountain... What I keep saying the reverse mountain, which I guess is sort of accurate, but like... She didn't know what Reverse Mountain was and everything like that. In the original, Nami doesn't know how to navigate the Grand Line. She just doesn't know. She doesn't know about log poses. She doesn't know about magnetic poles. When they first arrive at Reverse Mountain, in the original manga, she pulls out a normal compass and tries to plot a course, and she can't, and she freaks out. She literally did not know anything how to navigate the Grand Line. All right? That's in the original. All right? So she had to be told by Crocus how it worked. Yeah. So that's just, that's just, that's in the material. You might say, well, not in all, in all those years working for Arlong, she never figured out how to navigate. I guess not. I guess not. I, that's in the material. That's how it goes. Yeah. Crocus has to teach her. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, Sanji, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10 fighting style backstory. Uh, first impression of him was solid. He was my favorite straw hat. Um, until later Robin and Frankie showed up. 
He was he was my favorite, easily, hands down. All right. Have a good day, Teching. See ya. Off to a baseball game. I hope your team wins. Or loses if you bet on the other team. Whichever one. <laughs> it's like, I love my team, but they're up against that. I'm going to bet on the other team. They're going to win, obviously. Yeah. Uh, my phone sucks. I'm going to watch you when you upro upload. Yeah. You should totally stream you watching four kids all over again. Yeah. Should, should totally do that. That sounds like a fun time. Um... How did they introduce Vivi and Mr. Nine without the Laboon arc? They basically cut them. So there's a scene when when they get close to Whiskey Peak, they jump off the Mary and they swim to the island. So they're not on the ship when they get to Whiskey Peak. They literally go down Reverse Mountain and then there's just a hard cut where Luffy's like, where are we going first, Zoro? Because I guess in the four kids dub, Zoro has been to the Grand Line before. He's like, we're heading for a town called Misty Peak. It wasn't Whiskey Peak because it's alcohol. So we're heading for a town called Misty Peak. Okay. And then they arrive there. That's how it does. That's how they do it in the anime. That's how they do it in the four kids dub. Oh, man. Uh, when you're in terrible father competition with your opponent is Yasop or Jean. I, I feel like Yasop is the shittier father than Jean. Uh, yeah. They're both horrible, though. I thought Four Kids Dub was like a fever dream. Yeah. A lot of people had that impression. Okay. We're almost out of it, though. So next up, we have Choppa. And we know the image we have to use for that. Yep. <laughs> All right. So the coolest thing about when Chopper showed up for me, the thing that won me over to Chopper, it wasn't the fact he was he was like uh cuz he's very uh for marketing, he's like the mascot, you know? He's like the Pikachu of One Piece kind of, right? So for marketing, it's it's a big deal. There's actually I don't even know if this is true or not. But there was a theory, like uh, an idea, the reason four kids skipped Little Garden, because they skipped all of Little Garden, the reason they skipped it was because they wanted to get to Chopper quicker. So because Chopper has all this merchandise. I have, It probably wasn't the reason, but that was a theory, like an idea, like why did they skip Little Garden? Like what, like why, you know? So that that's the reason. Maybe it's the reason. Probably isn't, but who knows? But when Chopper first uh, went into his rumble ball stages and we found out about what zones can do, that was where Chopper won me over. Like, okay, he's got all these different forms he can go into depending on the situation, guard point, jump point. Uh, we found out horn point a little later, uh, you know, arm point. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, you won me over. He won me over in the same way that he won over Luffy in the fact that he's a talking, transforming reindeer. All right. So it was basically the same thing. It's like, oh, my God, you're a transforming reindeer. That's awesome. Like that was like, oh, my God, you are a transforming reindeer. That is awesome. You know, it's just like, yeah, yeah. Because I wasn't sitting there thinking like, oh, Chopper's adorbs, you know, because I'm like, you know. But uh, yeah, the transforming part with the with the drugs, like taking a drug to transform. Like, OK, yeah, that works for me. That works for me. Um, Chopper's voice. I think was relatively the same. Like, I think it, it's slightly deeper and it changes. I, I remember it changed when he went into heavy point, which is something I don't think they did in the Funimation. I think it's the same voice regardless of the form. Uh, in the four kids dub, when he goes into heavy point, he's like, I have this voice now, which kind of works because he is turning into like a giant, like Bigfoot Yeti kind of form, giving him a more imposing voice kind of makes sense. It is kind of jarring, though, to go having Chopper in his brain point being like, hey, everybody, I'm Tony Tony Chopper. I'm going to go off to the sea and become a pirate to being like, hello there, I'm Tony Tony Chopper. Like, he just ages up like 30 years or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, I remember that about him. Um, I think he's going to rank higher than just the average for me. I, I, I think I'm going to put him around uh, 7 out of 10. I think it was pl same place as Zorro. Yeah, I mean, like, there was... There was a thing there with the transformation thing. You just, you win me over with the transformation. So seven out of 10 for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they both take weed to become stronger. I wish they kept him as a monster instead of cute chopper. Um, oh, his design is very different, by the way. If you go back and look at Chopper, the way that Oda first draws him in the manga to the way he ended up, it's kind of like Pikachu, where Pikachu was way, way fatter, and they changed him to be more, like, streamlined, I guess. Uh, they're very different. 
Actually, let me see if I can pull up the original chopper. Because the original chopper is... there. There's a very clear difference. Uh, chopper manga intro. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, like, this is this is night and day. Okay, let me... There, there's one right next to the current and then the one where he first showed up. Like, look at that. So this is Chopper when he was first introduced. There's Chopper. And you can even tell with this, because this, this uh, is from the third movie. You can even tell there's a difference here already. But then here's Chopper post-time skip. Look at that. That's, yeah. You put them side by side there. That's, yeah. So that's an example of Oda definitely streamlining the design uh, over the years, definitely making his body way thinner. Like, Chopper just lost a lot of weight. Like, he wasn't, you know, he was living on the island. Maybe he had a lot of food. He wasn't, like, doing much of anything. But then he had to, he was going out to sea to be a pirate. He had to, he had to slim down, man. He had to really work hard, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there's that. I miss Chubby Chopper. Chubby Chopper. Mm. That's what drugs do to you, man. That's what drugs do to you. All right. Don't do drugs, kids. All right. So that's Chopper. Uh, next up, we have Robin. But not just any ordinary Robin. You're not dealing with your average Nico Robin anymore. Do I have any uh, cowgirl Robin? Uh, no. Hold on. That I need to rectify that immediately. Hold on a second. <laughs> I need to do pull up Miss All Sunday Robin immediately. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Hopefully this will just transfer over without me having to change anything. It did. Good. Great. Okay. All right. So Miss All Sunday Robin. Cowgirl Robin. So because it's four kids and she's wearing a cowgirl hat. I mean, she's wearing a cowboy hat, right? Like she has to, she has to talk like this. Hey, everybody. I'm a Southern Bale. How you <laughs> like, she literally has to talk like that. Um, and I think they do throw in some like old West kind of like, like lingo kind of vernacular with, with Robin's voice. Um, and I think, cause it's like, it's, it's pretty much right after Alabasta that four kids stops dubbing it. I think they do like, by the time we get to rainbow mist, I think they lighten up on that accent a little, but by that point, Funimation takes over. So there's not much with it. Um, so when Robin first showed up, uh, it was very much, I thought, like, because I didn't know, like, like when Sanji showed up, I'm like, yeah, straw hat. Chopper showed up. I'm like, yeah, he's going to be a straw hat. I didn't immediately think that with Robin. I immediately, I was genuinely stunned when Robin joined the crew. I remember my feelings on that. I remember when Robin showed up and was just like, I join. And Luffy's like, okay. And I'm like, oh my god, they have her on the crew now? She was so strong because her thing in Alabasta was like, she's just using her powers to take out Tashigi and Pell, like it's no big deal. And yeah, uh, Crocodile beats her, but she's supposed to be like really, really powerful. So I'm like, oh my god, the Straw Hats have her on the crew now? They're like unstoppable. Like I remember thinking that. I did not expect her to join. That was like a first shock moment. It was a twist. That was a twist for me. Um... And in the four kids dub, yeah, when when she's on the crew, when she gets on the ship, and she literally like there was um what was it when I did the video on oh what was oh yeah when I did the video on the um straw hat tournament you know when we had that tournament arc and Robin went up against Luffy in uh, being the best general somebody I was like oh yeah Robin is very manipulative not manipulative uh, the Game of Thrones thing yeah the Game of Thrones thing in that video Robin against Zoro is like who wins the Game of Thrones and I was like Robin is very manipulative and somebody in the comments was like I've never heard of Robin being any manipulative in the story when has she been manipulative and I'm like she literally manipulates Luffy to join the crew it's not hard because it's Luffy literally though she shows up on the Mary and is just like hey uh you uh beat my old boss and I, I'm out of a job now, so it's your responsibility to, to deal with this, so I'm now a member of your crew. And Luffy's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then that's how Robin becomes a... It doesn't take much, but she does sort of, like, use, like... Like, she had to roll a two for persuasion to get her to join, and she, like, crit... She critted. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, she has survived her entire life by manipulating people. Like, that literally, she has to do that. She's good at manipulating people, right? In the Four Kids dub, when, when Usopp is interrogating her, she, he's like, what's your specialty? And in the Four Kids dub, she famously says, oh, my specialty are rub outs. Now, she says that as, like, assassination, like, eliminating, like, rubbing people out, but... There's another way you can interpret that, you know, and it probably went over my head when I was a kid watching it. But uh, yeah, rewatching the four kids dubs the last couple of uh, years when well, it's been a few years now since we did them. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was. Yeah, it was like, oh, I remember that kind of. Yeah. Um, OK, so. Cowgirl, badass, Miss All Sunday Robin. I would say probably a nine. Yeah. I can't remember if I gave Nami an 8 or a 9, but I'm going to give Robin a 9. Because that twist genuinely surprised me. And it was like, wow, this character is so strong, right? And now, like, I I mean, like, does does Oda do the nerfing thing where, like, when the boss joins you, the boss is like, yeah, the boss is now part of your party. Now, it can't do any of the cool shit that it could do when you were fighting it, or it can, but it's extremely lower level. But the boss is now part of your party. It's like... Yeah, I, I don't like that that trope, but they don't do it too much. Like when they're at when they're at Jaya looking around for the Southbird, Robin's just like, Oh yeah, I could just grab one. There you go, done, easy. Yeah. Um Right. So that's Robin. Oh, by the way, also with Robin, I I didn't immediately think Robin was like my favorite straw hat though. I wasn't immediately like Robin is my new favorite straw hat after Sanji. That came later when Frankie showed up. And then Robin later after I was like, okay, I also really, really like Robin. Um, yeah. No, give her an 8 out of 10. No, a 9. Yeah. My boyfriend is obsessed with you. Say hi to Cody. Hi, Cody. How you doing, man? Hope you have a good day, man. Take your girlfriend out for ice cream. There you go. Uh, she did not get nerfed. She wanted for knowledge. Yeah, that's true. I wish the South Bird had stuck around, yeah. You know, it's funny, the, uh, um, um, Jacob Romero Gibson. There you go. I was, like, remembering Usopp's name in, in the live action. Uh, he actually did a, a video for April Fool's, and he talked about, like, all the things coming up in season two, and it was, like, it's a, it's a April Fool's video, so it was kind of supposed to be funny, and it didn't actually reveal a lot, but it revealed that, yeah, they are doing Little Garden, they are doing Dinosaurs, and there was a question in there about if, if the South Bird's gonna show up. And I don't know if the South Bird would show up in season two, but, uh, I, I think they could do the South Bird for pretty well, yeah. Okay. Next up, we have Frankie. Yeah, Frankie. My favorite straw hat. Frankie time. Super. Oh, yeah. We have a pre-time skip image of Frankie. Okay. So, I think because Frankie was this sort of, like, mystery factor. Because now this is at a point. Four Kids dub happens. Funimation dub happens. But the Funimation dub stopped releasing episodes on TV halfway through Skypea. It was, and I remember the fucking episode. It was like, light the fires of Shandora, Kalgara the hero, or the hero wiper or something. That was like the last episode they had. The episode where they, they found out that like half a Jaya was in the sky and the Shandorians are going to fight. And there was no more episodes on TV, on Toonami, about like, or Meguzi or whatever it was after that. All right. So... I can't watch One Piece anymore, but I also have the internet. Now, it's shitty dial-up internet, but I still have the internet. So at this point, I start learning about One Piece in Japan, like the anime where it's at there, and what's up with the manga, and I know through that that the Straw Hats do get a new member, and it's a shipwright, and his name is Frankie. But I hadn't actually seen him yet. So I was like, when I was like a teenager, like around 15, 16 years old, I was like fascinated by Frankie. Because I was like, man, Frankie, I know he's a cyborg and he talks really cool and he's got a cannon in his arm and he runs on soda. But I'm like, I'm learning about all this stuff from like fan sites 
and like trying to watch episodes and my internet's crap so I can't really watch I have to wait like like a half an hour to load five minutes of a One Piece episode online oh those were the days and then dude some days I would literally have to wait two hours for a 30 minute episode to like load and sometimes the internet would go out halfway and the and it would have to start all over oh man those were the golden days of the internet for sure so um what a throwback yeah I remember going down my grandparents house because my grandparents had better internet and watching episodes of Water 7 and Any's Lobby down there Oh man, watching like one p like one piece subs dot com or or whatever whatever website existed back then, dubbed anime dot net or whatever it was called. Oh, the compression it was so bad. So I didn't know a lot about Frankie, and I I kept waiting for Frankie to get an English voice, and um I think he got one in one of the video games first, uh, which wasn't bad, and then finally when the Funimation dub came back and the episodes, I remember watching the episodes online, like finding the dubbed episodes of like the rest of Skypea going into Long Ring Longland uh, and then uh, Water 7 and everything. I remember watching, it was probably like around 2010. I was probably like high school at that point, like like uh, junior, senior year of high school, something like that. And I remember finally re- learning about it, like, I remember watching episodes of One Piece in the computer lab at school because a lot of the subbed websites weren't like blocked by the school's like blocker. They would block like YouTube and stuff, but they wouldn't block really random like anime websites. So I remember being in, in Mr. Miner's, uh, that was our computer class teacher, Mr. Miner. Kind of looked like Mr. Clean. He had like a bald head. No, no, he kind of looked like Howie Mandel. Yeah, Mr. Miner kind of looked like Howie Mandel. And he was our computer teacher. And I remember finishing the lesson in class for like Microsoft Excel or something and then just watching anime. And occasionally my friends would give me shit for it. Like, You're watching anime. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I'm kind of watching anime. And I'm watching Frankie beat the crap out of Fukuro at Eni's Lobby. That scene where he goes with Super and the theme starts. But I thought his theme was the coolest. Um, Probably one of the first anime soundtracks I downloaded on my phone. Probably. Actually, I think I might still have it. This playlist on my phone has been the same. I've been cultivating this playlist since high school. Uh, so I think I might still have Frankie's OST on here. I don't. I took it off. But how could you take it off? But that was one of the first things I added. Yeah. <laughs> he was the minor 49er. I don't remember how he spelled it. Probably the first way. I don't know, though. Yeah. <laughs> Bald guy goatee. Which, if you're bald, I think if I feel like most guys, if you go bald or if you're just bald, you got to do the goatee. It's like an it's like an added bonus. He could have worked. He could have done the super villain angle too. Like he could have been a super villain in like a show or a movie or something. I guess it could have worked. He was a fine. He was an okay teacher. He was a great teacher. But like, yeah, Mister White, not not quite like Walter White. Didn't look. Didn't really look like Walter White. Like Brian Cranston too much. Because Brian Cranston has a very distinctive face, you know? I remember watching my hentai in my English class. I remember one time in middle school, there was a student that changed the um, uh, changed the desktop, desktop wallpaper in one of the uh, computers at Computer Lab into porn. He just put up an image of, of porn. He, like, did it, and then he walked out. I think what he did was he changed the desktop background, and then class ended, and he turned off the monitor, and he just walked out of the class... And then the next student came in and turned it on and just like, ah, oh, and then the teacher saw it. I was like, hey, what did you do? I was like, I didn't do it. It was like, they eventually found out who it was and they got in trouble for it. But I, I remember that. That was funny. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Lex Luthor. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Yeah, he could have, he could have played Lex Luthor. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Anyway, that was Frankie. I mean, 11 out of 10. 11 out of 10 for Frankie. Because there was so much build up for him. Like, I can't wait for this character. Like, can we get dubbed episodes back so I could see Frankie? Yeah, it was awesome. All right, Frankie. Next up, we have Brooke. Brooke. Got a straw hat right after a straw. Oh, here's a, here. I think this is the first episode he's in. Perfect. Okay. Um. Question about Brooke really quick. Because I was thinking about this today when I was planning on making this a video instead of a live stream. Um, When did the straw hats find out he was a musician? Did... Because I don't think he wasn't he wasn't playing the violin when the Straw Hats met him. He was just sipping tea. And then the Straw Hats meet him on the ship. And then Luffy does the can you poop thing. When, and then they go to dinner together. Like they, he goes on the sunny and then they have dinner. But I'm trying to remember, like, when did they find out he was a musician? Because they I don't think they found out right away. Because if they found out right away he was a musician, I'd be like, oh, yeah, he's obviously going to be a member of the Straw Hats. Because uh, they want a musician. Right. 
Um, they found out when Brooke was on the ship. He just randomly mentions it? Okay. It was right after the dinner. All right, right, right. It was, oh, it was when it was, see, see, yeah, see, that's why I can't remember exactly. Was it during the dinner? Was it on the ship? Was it after he beat Talaran? Like, wh when was it exactly that they find out? He starts playing the violin. He states, he starts playing the violin right there after dinner? I thought right after dinner, he, his face is all covered in, in food, so he wipes it off. And then he tells them about, they, they notice he doesn't have a shadow. And, well, he was singing, he was humming, but that doesn't, like, make me immediately think he was a musician, right? Um, so, he, they see the shadow thing, and then he jumps off the ship and then goes to Thriller Bark after that. Yeah. I think he had a piano on the ship, but I just don't think he was playing it. He did bring out the violin after dinner. Okay, all right. So now we're getting into the time where... I'm not quite reading the manga weekly yet. I'm getting there. But we're getting to the moment now where I'm now watching... The internet in my house is better, and now I'm watching, like, subbed and dubbed anime off of perfectly legitimate websites. <laughs> um, and I'm, like, a teenager watching, you know, One Piece subbed and dubbed stuff. And uh, then I'm getting after Annie's Lobby, moving into Thriller Bark. Uh, I think I did skip over the Donacino shit and then getting into Thriller Bark. I think the anime at this point was right around Saba Odie. Like, that was weekly episodes. The newer episodes were Saba Odie. So I was, I was in the process of catching up, basically. And so getting to, to Brooke stuff. And I remember also being really, really, not as much as Frankie, because Frankie had a lot of hype building up to him. But when it came to Brooke... It was like, okay, Skeleton Man with a sword. This guy's pretty neat. Uh, I think I did know he was a member of the crew because, like, I had been reading stuff about where the manga was, and I was reading the wiki at this point. Uh, this was right around the time I started reading wikis for Bleach and Naruto and One Piece. So I would have known he was a crewmate, and I would have known it happened. Um, Brooke, I think, solid seven. Seven, same as Chopper and Zoro. I'll, I'll put him there. You know what? Eight. No, Brooke gets an eight just because he's a skeleton. He's a skeleton man. Uh, and then learning also about his backstory with Laboon, how it all tied back together. Because that was a thing where it's like, oh, that tied back because I'm like 16 at this point, And it's like remembering the show. Well, no, I guess Laboon wasn't in the original show, so I might have had to go back and rewatch it. I don't remember exactly how I figured it out. Um, but I did. And then, yeah, so there it is. Brooke gave me a Michael Jackson vibe, so I loved him. Yeah, I mean, Brooke... There was a lot going on with his character, just the fact of, like, initially when you meet him, he's a skeleton, but then he's missing a shadow, and it's like, oh, that has nothing to do with me being a skeleton. It's like, okay, what? So it's like a thing where you gotta, like, there's a lot going on with his character at first, might get a little confusing, but Oda handles it very well. <laughs> Brooke exists, that's different. I'm like, yeah, it is different. I, uh, something else I remember, I remember watching it and thinking, like, do, are we ever going to find out, like, w like what Brooke looked like? Like, I thought that was, like, a carefully guarded secret, like, Brooke, what he looked like when he was alive. Like, I thought that was going to be a story that we weren't going to find out right away, but we do find out about it during Thriller Bark. Like, oh, this is what happened. This is how he died. You know, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be interesting if Brooke kept that, like, a secret for a while? Like, we didn't know what Brooke looked like when he was alive until, like, a few arcs later or something like that. Like, that would have been interesting in its own right. Like, keep the mystery a little bit going on. Um, but, yeah, no, it's after what happened with Sab Odie, it's it had to be shown right there. His voice is also brilliant. Dude, Ian Sinclair is, like, the amazing... I Like, when they get to Brooke, hopefully, eventually, if, they, if the live action keeps going, Brooke's obviously going to have to be CG... But I just hope they get Ian Sinclair to do his voice because, I mean, I can't think of anybody else that can really nail it. I mean, other than the original Japanese VA, obviously. But, like, yeah, Brooke's voice, he has so much fun with that. There would have been so many more theories. Yeah, there would have been a lot more theories. I thought it was, like, some, like, oh, this is a secret. How did he die? I was like, no. And there's a lot of theories around that. Like, it was the Jerma that killed him. And, like, eh, it could have been. That was never really addressed one way or the other. It could have been some earlier version of the German double six that killed them that used poison weapons. We never see his eyes. Ooh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, remember a rookie named Roger. I remember that, yeah. Okay, so that was Brooke, 8 out of 10. And now we get to the final straw hat, which is right on time because I only got like 20 more minutes of this left. So got to finish this up and then uh, get ready to go. So yeah, this actually ended up working out perfect timing. Gene Bay. Do I have an image of him when he was in Impel Down? Um, I do not. 
So we're just going to go with Dad Gene Bay disapproving glare. I think this is the look he gives who's who when who's who's basically like, hey, I have a question and it involves slavery. And hey, Gene Bay, you were a slave, right? I mean, you're a fish man, so all fish men are slaves. I mean, you know shit about slavery. I'm just saying you're a fish man. Anyway, I have a question for you. <laughs> and then Gene Bay is just like, Ugh, gotta deal with this bigoted shit again. All right. All right. I, like, Gene Bay's looking at him the glare of like, all right, I know where this is going. Fuck this guy. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, once again, did not have and uh, did not know that Gene Bay was going to join the crew at first. Um, Gene Bay shows up in Impel Down and, you know, he they free him. And by the way, this is ironic. Technically speaking, I guess this is the newest straw because I started reading One Piece Weekly manga in Impel Down. The uh, chapter, I think the chapter was just called Minotauros, where they're in level three. And then Minotauro shows up and Mr. Two Bonclay and Luffy fight him. Excuse me. First chapter of One Piece I read when it was new, like when it came out, like one, like on one manga or something, or manga stream way back in the day. Uh, and I was like a sophomore in high school at the point. So that was that, right? So uh, it wasn't long after that, that I think it was actually right before that, that Jinbei even was first introduced. Like you see him in the cell and it's like, you know, the seventh warlord of the sea, Jinbei. And I'm like, whoa, okay. Uh, also, a huge tie back to East Blue when Yosuku mentioned him. So, Jibei is actually the second one mentioned. Like, Oda had this plan. That's the thing about Oda I love. Like, Oda always remember. Okay, maybe he doesn't always remember every little detail, but the major plot beats. Like, way back in East Blue, he had an idea for Jinbei being the captain of the Sun Pirates and everything that was happening. It just took, like, ten years to him to get to that plot point, but he eventually got there, right? It's not like he's going to forget about, like, oh, yeah, Jinbei, yeah, he was not relevant. No, he was a member of the Warlords, and it just took me a while to get to him, right? Here he goes. Um, so, he... The, the, awesome, when he goes through Impel Down, they're just beating their way through all of the, the uh, guards in level four, and Jean Bay is just like, you know, 10,000 brick fist, woo! And it just the shockwaves hit all the guards. They're just storming through. Go to Marine Ford there. He's a boss. But I'm still not thinking like he's going to join the crew. I'm just thinking, because there's so many other crazy characters that Luffy meets in Impel Down, right? Like Ivankov, Inazuma, Crocodile's back. Here's, uh, here's Jean Bay. Here's Buggy and Galdino. So I'm not even, the last thing I'm thinking is Jean Bay is going to be a member of the crew. I'm not even thinking that. Like, not thinking that any more than, like, Ivankov's going to join, or Inazuma's going to join, or, or Mr. Two's going to, or Mr. Two or Buggy's going to join, right? It's like, Jean, the Jean Bay's like part of Luffy's de facto crew while he's separated from the Straw Hats, right? Um, but he did stand out because of his ethics. Yeah, Joy Boy, you have a good point there, where he just resigns from his position at Marine Ford. He fights Moria at Marine Ford. I thought that was a really cool fight scene there. Um, and... Even when we got to Fishman Island, I still didn't think that, like, he was going to join the crew. I didn't immediately think, like, this arc is going to end with Jinbei joining. Now, when we got to the blood-sharing scene, the transfusion scene between Luffy and Jinbei, I mean, once you see that image, like, I'll even pull it up here for you. Like, there's no way, like, that was the moment where even though Jinbei does not, I mean, like, I, it's obvious because Luffy literally asks him to join during that scene. In the next chapter, he's like, I can't right now, but, you know, it's it's going to happen. Like, that scene was really, really powerful. Blood transfusion scene, yeah. Like, when, when you see this scene here. Like, he's a straw hat. He's He's gonna be a member of the straw hat crew. There's no other way to interpret this, okay? Like, yeah. Now, obviously, there's multiple meanings to this scene. It's not just him joining the crew and being a friend of Luffy. This is symbolic of humans and fishmen sharing literally the same blood and being together in camaraderie and putting aside hundreds of years of racism and all that stuff is like, no, this can work. Humans and fishmen can live together under the same sun. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, different uh, subtext with this scene. But yeah. And actually, I remember being really disappointed after this scene. Because in the next... It's a, such an emotional scene. And then in the next chapter... Dude, it's not even a big deal. Like, in the next chapter, 
There's just a random thing in the background where Luffy's like, what do you mean you're not joining Jean Bay? It's just like, what? Huh? Wait, he didn't join? So, and then it, then that starts a 10-year journey where Jean Bay is not a member, but he's a member. Uh, but I, you know what? I, even throughout all those years, I never questioned, like, Jean Bay's not going to be a member. Like, it's going to happen. Punk Hazard goes by, Dressrosa goes by, and Dressrosa was a long-ass arc. Zoe goes by, and then we get to a whole cake, and even after a whole cake, he's not a really a member, and it's like, okay, this is gonna happen. It's clearly he's gonna be a straw hat. It's just taken a really long time for him to get there. And then when we finally reach that point, when he shows up before, he has impeccable timing. I'll give him that. He shows up right before the final war. Literally right before they land at Onigashima, he shows up. Like, all right, all right. That was kind of maybe being like Oda being like, oh, wait, um, Jinbei's there now. All right, he's a stride. Let's go with this. Do this finally. Yeah. And it's like, okay, okay. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. He's a straw hat now. Okay, we'll deal with that. We'll go. Uh, Jinbei gets a... See, Jean Bay's journey now is more or less about when I was growing up, when I was 12, watching four kids, and now more about, like, like I'm making YouTube videos at this point. You know what I mean? Like, I'm doing Bleach reviews, and eventually I'm making One Piece reviews, and Jean Bay's still not technically a, a crew member yet, so a lot of it is biased on that extent. But this is first impressions of him from Impel Down. I would say 8 out of 10. I would say 8 out of 10. Yeah was an awesome entrance by Jim Bay. Jim Bay. Yes. Jim Bay gives you the disapproving dad glare. Whenever you fail in life, just picture Jim Bay. Like, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. And there it is. Uh, to be fair, Wano was a very long arc. Oh, yes. And the, the thing is about Wano, like, even with it being the length it was, it's, it feels like there's Oda, like, still could have made it longer. Like, Oda could have made it 200 chapters easy if he included, like, everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, Vivi, like, yeah. Like, last impressions there. I, I could squeeze in Vivi here. Um, I think I have a, a way back when I did the original Straw Hat videos. I did a video on Vivi. Yeah. Vivi, there she is. There's Whiskey Peak, Vivi. Actually, you know what's funny? Her appearance in the anime changes in like one episode. This is how she appeared when we found out that she was a princess. This is how she's drawn before that. There's like a very notable difference with just like, yeah, it's her hair mainly, but I think just the way her face is drawn is a little bit different. And it changes within like an episode. Like, you, you could tell that, like, it's a different kind of way that she's being depicted here. But, yeah, I really liked Vivi. And uh, when she did leave, I was pretty shocked by that. I, I did not expect her to just be like, eh, she's going to, well, hmm. I'm trying to remember, like, the way that I originally viewed this. Like, way, this is, like, over, like, oh, God, almost 20 years ago now. 19 years ago. I'm going to be 31 this year. This is when I was 12. Like, oh, my God. Well, anyway, um, so maybe I did think that, like, once you get to Alabasta, she's not going to be around anymore because that was her whole story arc. But maybe I, maybe I did think, maybe I wasn't even thinking about like whether or not she's going to be a crew member or not. Maybe it, it was at this point it was just like, oh, here's a character. We'll just journey with her and see what happens. And like, oh, she's a member, okay, or she's she stays behind, whatever. Yeah, uh, it was super noticeable for me. If you watch it, if you watch those two episodes back to back, it's super noticeable. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I kind of like Vivi during uh, that the villain design better. I mean, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you, uh, the first time we see her is actually at the end of the second movie. We see uh, uh, her drawn in like a, in actually her original outfit. Her original outfit doesn't look like that in the manga. It's like, it's not like a wavy pattern. It's like, like, um, like, cause like concentric circles. Like it's supposed to like hypnotize you is, is what they were going for. Oh my god, hold on a second. Okay, here we go. Second movie. It was Clockwork Island Adventure. At the very end, during the credits, we get different scenes. And one scene is we get Whiskey Peak. And this is before Whiskey Peak was animated. And you see Vivi there. So you can see... And Karu is drawn 
very differently. <laughs> Karu looks more of like just a regular duck in the background, and Vivi, very different. And you get to see her her specific outfit there. Yeah. Her manga outfit. It's circly. Yeah. It's very circly. Actually, wait a minute. Maybe I have a uh, drawing of her in the uh, manga here. Um. Yeah, here it is. This is her outfit in the manga. Not that I would have seen. Well, no, it might have been in the original Shonen Jump. I'll give Vivi a six. Six out of ten. Because that's the way she originally hypnotizes people. In the anime, they change it to um, perfume. She uses, like, perfume to, like, you know, entrance you. Um... Why did they change it? I don't know. I genuinely don't know about this one. Um, cause I mean, you real I mean, you could say it's sexually suggestive. Like she's more of like a like a belly dancer in this one. But like, is it really that sexually suggestive? Like, I guess you could look at them like nipples or something. Uh, I guess. But yeah. Gaze deeply at my body. Yes. Well. Anyway, Vivi would be six out of ten, yeah. And I hope she rejoins and just we go full on to Laugh Tale with Vivi as a member of the crew. I'm down like that. Yeah, I'm down with that. Was there a scene where Vivi would pull a string and the circles would spin? No, I don't remember anything like that. It's just that when she's dancing in the manga, I mean, you see, I mean, this is the one time it comes up is when she starts dancing and it's like mesmeric with, like with that but this isn't in the anime. So maybe cuz if you look at a hypnotizing like thing, I have one. I could pull one up. It actually if like if you stare at it long enough, it does mess with your vision. Maybe they were afraid of that or something. Um but I uh yeah. So anyway, that I got to get going because this is actually perfect timing for this that we ended this out. Uh I will Saga King first impressions. That has to be for next time. Oh, I got to roll the wheel. I'm not done yet. I still have a wheel to roll. We got to go to the wheel. Okay, here we go. Wheel time. Thanks, guys, for reminding me about the wheel. Okay, let me add in uh, the wheel. What did we talk about today? Today was uh, da -da 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 -da, first impressions of the straw hats. Let me take that out. Uh, where is first impression? Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. We got a lot of other wacky things on this wheel. Got a lot of stuff. Okay. Let me pull that over to X split here. You have a hypno suit? Yes. I do. <laughs> I have every kind of suit imaginable. All right. Look at this wheel, guys. Look how great this wheel is. We got Horty Jones. We got a Kaku video. We got an animal tier list. We got the Sariyama Alliance video. We got Kid at Elbath. There's another one on here about Kid being a member of the Vegapunks, because that's a theory that's been spinning around lately. If that makes no sense to you, don't worry. It does. Uh, we got underutilized characters. We got morality and ideology of the Vegapunk satellites. We got it all. All right. Let's spin D wheel. Da, 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 da. Okay, we're talking about Dadan in the next video. You know what? That one is actually, I am actually quite surprised. I did not, there is somebody at my front door. Okay, I am actually quite surprised that uh, we, I've never done a video on Curly Dadan before. She was basically Luffy's mom. Okay, so um, we're talking about Dadan next time. Luffy's mom. If you're curious about Luffy's mom, Dadan is authoritatively Luffy's mom. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching signing out. Bye. Sayonara. Later, Gators.